Um, so actually, I think why we wanted to really pick your brain today is we want to talk more uh, to the endurance athlete population. Mm -hmm. You know, assuming that someone is going to take on the risks that are associated with endurance sports and they want to do triathlons, long course stuff of all kinds of dis distances, um, we have a few questions on you know how we can mitigate the damages of that. So that's one side of it, and I guess from where I'm coming at it from is. I see people that follow the bulletproof movement as a medical doctor, as a functional medicine practitioner as well, and they kind of want to buy into it and they want to buy a hack and they want to improve their testosterone, their sex drive. They want to sleep five hours a night and still be really functional and have a family. They want to do it all. They want to be like you, but live their crazy life. Um, and I kind of wanted, wanted to explore a little bit around the testosterone issue because I know cool. you used to use testosterone. Oh, I'm using it right now. Okay. You are. You're okay. okay. Could you just tell me a little bit about how you use it, how you track the biomarkers associated with its use, sure. and how you mitigate any side effects? I started using testosterone when I was 26. I was still obese, and I went to a, an anti-aging doctor, which very few 26-year-olds go to, but mm -hmm. the guy actually had the skills I was looking for around figuring out what the heck is going on here, because I worked out an hour and a half a day, six days a week, half cardio at 15 degree treadmill with a backpack and half weights to the point I could max out almost every machine at the gym. So I could bench press my thin friends while they're eating cheeseburgers and I was eating salads mm -hmm. and I was tired and I was fat and I was strong. And I was really frankly pissed about the whole thing. Mm. So I went to this, this doctor and I was exhausted too, as you might imagine with that kind of a training regimen. Uh, lots of willpower, I did that for 18 months. And I, I went to him and he's like, your mom has more testosterone than you do, Dave. Your numbers are in the, the technical term was in the shitter. Um. <laughs> so, or in the crapper for my friends in the UK. And in the loo, I don't know what you guys say. She says loo. You <laughs> say loo, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, they were not good. So what, uh, what I did is I went on testosterone. And I used uh, the transdermal cream, it was 10%, it was called lipopen cream. And I don't remember my exact dose, but my numbers were from memory around 200, and they should have, for someone in my mid to late 20s, should have been seven, 800 at least. Mm -hmm. And these are US metrics, you guys can use different ones um, over in the EU, I'm not sure. But what I, I did is I said, look, I'm gonna start doing this, and I did it, and I took a Remedex, and I took a Clomid, and a Remedex, inhibits, and you know this because you're a medical doctor, but it inhibits the conversion back to estrogen, which is a problem. As an obese person, mm. I had lots of fat. Mm. Fat makes testosterone turn into estrogen and manufactures estrogen directly. So this is a big problem. And then I also took Clomid because my FSH levels were, and my LH levels were, were very low. It's the brain control of the testicular production of yeah. testosterone. And, and you, could, you could probably argue, and in fact I would argue that I had autoimmune hyper autoimmune pituitary issues going on because almost all of the pituitary hormones, including my thyroid, were off. Uh, oh, and my growth hormone was off too. So there you go. I have the trifecta of everything that the pituitary controls was broken. And there are lab studies that show when you live in a building with toxic mold, the toxic mold can cause your immune system to attack your pituitary gland. Right. So that is the causative factor. You think it may have been. It's, it's, those years. Of yeah, it was one of them. Right. And I've done a documentary for people listening uh, called yeah. Moldy Movie, moldymovie.com, about environmental mold and just what a huge problem it is for all sorts of strange conditions that people are having. It's one of the biggest sources of like hidden kryptonite in the world around us. And it kind of tried to take me out and it lost. So <laughs> what I did though is I, I took these things and I took them for about five or six years and I went off of Remedex and I went off of Clomid because I improved my biomarkers and I track these things every six months to every year, depending on convenience and mm -hmm. things like that. Blood tests or do you use the blood Dutch tests? tests from yeah, just, just blood tests. I'm mm. pretty, pretty old fashioned that way, I guess. And then I, uh, I went off the Remedex and Clomid and I did testosterone for another, I'm guessing, four or five years. Mm -hmm. And I mostly did armpit. I started to get a little bit concerned because uh, testosterone, topically, a, a little bit of it rubbed in the right places on your wife is actually really good. They call it scream cream. But too much of it <laughs> rubbed on your wife in other places is like goatee time. And we're dealing with pregnancy and we're dealing with small children or even a little bit of testosterone that could be rubbed off of your arm or something and get on your kids, you know, from your sheets or something that would be really bad. 
So I also was concerned, well, look, the Bulletproof Diet has totally changed my life. I took modafinil, a strong performance enhancing smart drug, and I was on national news talking about it lots of times, like doping. People come lives. and ask me for that after listening to your podcast. It's, it's so good, but <laughs> a lot of people don't need it. No. Right? For me, I was dealing with a lot of biological problems, and for eight years, I, I, I got an MBA at Wharton while working full time. I would not have graduated without smart drugs. Like it really helped my relationships, helped my meditation. It gave me the energy to do the things that helped me become bulletproof. So I'm grateful for it. But I went off of testosterone and I went off of modafinil uh, during the research for the bulletproof diet just to see, okay, is it just these things? I knew it was just those things, so I'd taken them for eight years. But you just want to see what happens. And what I found was that my testosterone levels actually sustained reasonably well. They dropped some, they're more highly variable. Mm -hmm. And I found out that with modafinil, as long as I'm getting my bulletproof coffee with brain octane oil, there's almost no measurable difference on seven different measures of executive function, like laboratory grade quantifiable things. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not getting brain octane, modafinil is a really good thing to do. So if I can boost my mitochondria energy in the brain enough, like I'm essentially the same on or off of modafinil. So it doesn't do anything when your body's working really, really well. No, it totally does. And so for your patients who are asking for it, mm -hmm. if it's like for jet lag or you're going to drive across the country and you don't want to die, mm -hmm. you should probably have an emergency stash. You want to take it every day? Have you done everything else you can to turn up the thermostat? Sure. Right? I, that's just good advice in general anyway. But is it, should you have it for that time when, you know, I had to, I had to ace the test, I had to pull an all-nighter? Uh, yeah. Maybe you should. Okay. <laughs> So what did you do with the testosterone? Did you take an injection now or? Now I use injections. Yeah. And I started up about a year ago okay. and I got my levels and I dropped back down to about 500. I'm 43 mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason that I dropped is that I took some pregnenolone, which is a, mm -hmm. a precursor hormone. And I took this, it's a, a normal kind of adrenal function thing. Mm -hmm. and. I have this problem because I was obese and, and maybe just the other genetic things. I aromatized the crap out of things. Yeah. Every pathway, DHEA, has always completely killed my sex drive. Right. <laughs> Which is weird. For most people, yeah. DHEA raises mm -hmm. testosterone. No, for me, I'm like, you know, man boob time. So the same thing happened with the pregnenolone. I'm like, all right, I grew man boobs again. My estrogen went up, even though, like, why does everything go to estrogen in me? It's not fair. So I do testosterone. I inject uh, 0.35 mills twice a week of testosterone in sesame oil, cibernate, uh, and then uh, I take a Remedex, like a half a tab, I don't remember the size, I think they're 45 milligrams, but don't mm -hmm. quote me on that, is that twice a week. Okay. And I don't need Clomid. And what do you think now about in terms of exercise, we know you're yeah. a big proponent of sort of high intensity exercise, and a lot of the people that do listen to, mm -hmm. you know, because of my history, Tony's history, are endurance athletes. You guys are studs. <laughs> Huh. No, seriously, you do stuff I couldn't. We like, learned I, a lot. Um, like, like, <laughs> but yeah, for, for the endurance athletes specifically, if they're competing, they can't be taking things like DHEA and testosterone, at least not they, publicly. They should be able to. Like, what kind of a mean society do you That's take? That's a people? whole other conversation. This is not, like, seriously, like, you organizing, <laughs> like, you mean people. Stop torturing endurance athletes. Allow them to recover faster. You should be pumping growth hormone and testosterone after an event in order to recover faster. Medically, don't you agree if it wasn't for some dumb rules? I think it would need to be done very uh, monitored wow. and controlled um, <laughs> and not when you're competing in like the Olympic Games or Ironman or whatever. But, I just yeah, think for I mean, recovery, not during competition. I think, I think the people we need to study, and I've said this before, are the ones that manage to do Ironman and some crazy ass events and still maintain good testosterone levels over a good period yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah. Same with female athletes, and yes. we wanted to touch on that because. Well, wait, real quick on the testosterone. Yeah. I wanted to, if Assuming someone can't be taking testosterone or DHEA and they want to compete in endurance ath athletics and they are exhibiting low testosterone, test symptoms, all that, what would be, if you have any ideas on, I mean, diet, yeah. obviously. More sleep, more egg yolks, egg yolks, more butter, more raw or very rarely cooked steak. Right? Like those are going to make a difference. The other thing that, and this applies to men, not women, although there might be a way in women. This is going to sound weird, but it was part of my talk at, at the conference here. Get a sun tanning lamp and expose your junk. How did you say that? <laughs> Red yeah. light or does no, it matter? No, it needs to be ultraviolet. Ultraviolet. So okay. literally, like lay in the sun with your legs spread. If you live in a neighborhood like me, I'm on an organic farm, I do that. <laughs> uh, or 
like I'm on a conference call and no one knows. <laughs> or more likely because I live in Canada where it's not sunny most of the year. I have a, a tanning lamp that's high in ultraviolet UV radiation. And yeah, I expose my testes to ultraviolet light because in studies you get 200 to 400% more testosterone production than you do if you just expose your skin to ultraviolet light. But if you're an endurance athlete and you're not getting any UV light during recovery or if you're, if you're putting on sunscreen every day because you're afraid of skin cancer, mm -hmm. you're actually inhibiting testosterone production. And you're crushing your nuts on a bike, for God's sake. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds a little painful. I Just used to, to be aero. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I used to do endurance cycling when I was fat, too. I, I did a lot of that when I lived in Albuquerque as a teenager trying to lose weight. And I never lost weight, but I'm sure I smashed a few things. So. Aromatase inhibitors, do you recommend taking? That but they're illegal really as well. Are they? Yeah. Uh, not dim, so. Dim isn't. So yeah, dim. I was going to uh, say broccoli, dim would yeah. be a good thing. Chrysin seems to be okay. Mm -hmm. right? I'm not sure how effective chrysin, chrysin mm -hmm. is. I've never felt any effect from it, but some people swear by it. Um, the other thing that might be interesting for your listeners is something I've recommended for years, uh, and is calcium deglutamate. And there's two main detox pathways in the liver, and you know this because you're a medical doctor. We just doctor. listened to Dr. Tammy talking about it, actually. Oh, was she talking about glucarate? Uh, no, she was talking about the liver detox. Okay, but, yeah. cool. So we have like the cytochrome P450 pathways in like phase one and phase two detox. And essentially, they use glutathione, which is something that everyone who's an endurance athlete ought to be using. And yes, I manufacture glutathione. We're all low on it on labs, like yeah. organic acids testing. It, I do a lot of it. It has to be, okay. You see it all the time? Yeah. So you could just say, well, I'll just have to make more, or you could cyclically use it, and I'd make a, an exceptionally absorbable oral form uh, called glutathione force. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, so I have an incentive to talk about it, but gee, biochemically, I make it because I wanted it. So it is what it is, but glutathione would be the primary detox pathway. But the secondary one is called glucarination. And calcium deglucarate has the unique ability to help you get rid of excess estrogen. Mm -hmm. So it's not really an aromatase inhibitor, but it helps you dump gotcha. all the aromatized estrogen more quickly. Mm -hmm. And this is a neat hack. And I think everyone who's an endurance athlete with testosterone issues ought to be pounding the detox agents because you already have too much oxidative stress, yeah. right? And you already have liver detox pathway issues because of oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. So let's address that. And meanwhile, while you're at it, let's do things that are mitochondrial precursors or mitochondrial enhancers. Primary one being always be in low grade ketosis. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> is that my a, lot, a lot of people do in the in the athletic world are on this high fat, low carb, and bulletproof you know approach in terms of diet. But female athletes do kind of fall off the, the cliff sometimes. I, I don't mean me and Tony included have done over the years. I, I don't mean high fat, low carb, I just mean moderate ketosis. Okay. If you're putting brain octane on your food three times a day. That's gonna be an it, exogenous source yeah, of ketones. Yeah, it's an exogenous source of ketones. I do not recommend ketone salts at all. Okay. And there's a couple reasons for that. I want to recommend ketone salts. However, I have lab tested every keto salt product on the market, and I've looked at launching my own. Dr. Beach's uh, interview on Bulletproof Radio uh, Dr. Beach worked with Hans Krebs, has 40 years of research of ketones, a very, very credible NIH research guy, like super solid. Uh, he's questioning their overall safety. But Dominic D'Agostino, who's been on Bulletproof Radio a couple times, is a huge fan of them. And I, I listened to both of them, and they're both very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. I've synthesized my own ketones well, three and a half years ago. Like, I'm really into this stuff. But when I lab test every manufacturer out there and every shelf product I can find, I always find exceptionally high levels of acetone and formaldehyde to the point that between two and three doses of any of the products is going to put you over the daily acceptable limit from the FDA, which is known for making very conservative limits. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So potentially, you know, <laughs> cancer causing, which is not good, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, th there's, those things have no business being in supplements, not at the levels that are common on the market today, and that's why I I'm really concerned about this in the industry, and when there's a clean one, I'll put my name on it. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, this isn't well talked about, but it, uh, I'm raising the alarm because this, I only Absolutely. got this data a couple weeks ago. Okay. And it's, it's a little bit scary, frankly, uh, because this is total daily limit that the FDA talks about, and we're talking two doses yeah. of, of some of the some of the brands are enough to put you over your daily from all sources. Mm -hmm. So if you eat fruit, you get formaldehyde. There's always trace amounts of the stuff. If you breathe stuff, you get formaldehyde. But if you're getting a lot of it in something that's supposed to enhance ketones, it's just not worth it, mm -hmm. given that you have a huge amount of salt that comes in from those. 
Uh, I have high hopes for ketone esters when they're available and affordable. When I synthesized them, it was $30,000 a kilo. It was outside my pay grade. <laughs> but, so we made this much, and I'm like, try them once. <laughs> That's why Brain Octane, though, which we have a new study, it raises ketones mm -hmm. more than MCT oil, and it raises ketones uh, way more than coconut oil, and coconut oil raises ketones exactly as much as fasting and no more, which okay. is also unknown, but this is good research from the University of California. Mm -hmm. So I look at that stuff. The reason that you care about ketones as an endurance athlete is ketones are prime, just primarily antioxidant in the cells. When you burn a ketone, you turn off a lot of the reactive oxygen species. So literally, if I finish, well, before and during, I'd want to have a little bit of brain octane to the extent it doesn't make you get disaster pants, but even a little bit is enough to raise ketones. Get them to 0.5, which is below nutritional ketosis, it changes the, the inflammation in your cells in a very meaningful way. That's a very good point. What about the adaptation? You know, they're saying that taking antioxidants and stuff like that, uh, the RLS species after exercise may actually elicit the adaptation to exercise by, you know, Kind of like the same way, a little bit of inflammation is good to help healing and whatnot. So, would bef still taking ketones afterward be beneficial, or like if you're looking at trade offs of? I, I think he's talking about something. I think uh, I think you differentiate. I think antioxidants in general taken after exercise can hamper the endurance right. adaptation. But that would be things like you know like high dose selenium, alpha lipoic acid, or even your glutathione, right? Bit C and or or and absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I think you okay. need to do a little bit. Clearer. So there's a little okay different pathways. Yeah. Things we're talking about here. Okay. On a heavy training day, don't use antioxidants and pay the price. The day after though, there's probably a case for taking them. So you yeah. need the ROS as a signaling molecule. Okay. That's absolutely important. But you don't have to do it all the time. And here's what isn't worked out in endurance athlete. Uh, in, in endurance athletic training, you're going to train X amount of time at X level of intensity. So at what point do you want to quench the free radicals? You need enough free radical production to tell the cells, you better be able to make SOD and catalase. Like you better be able to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. That's part of becoming a strong and highly functioning mitochondria. By the way, my next book coming out in April is all about mitochondria. I, I, I write about this stuff. So you look at that and you're like, okay, you certainly shouldn't quench these things. But on the other hand, if you don't quench them and you're exercising every day, when does the recovery happen? Mm -hmm. So I look to this, and I'm not an expert in endurance training, but I'm an expert in hopefully living to 180. I'll tell you if I'm an expert when I'm 180. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm looking at this from an aging and a cancer and all these, these different uh, performance metrics. And uh, there is a case that says, if you want to maximize your training volume, at some point, after you've gotten the benefit of the free radicals and the signaling, you need to cut that off yeah. because, like, the cell adaptation signal was already received. Now let's cut that off so that you can work out again sooner. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you need to get a lot more sleep and a lot more rest. That's the key point, and a lot of people don't want to do that. They want to biohack their way into, you know, sleeping less and training more. And I think we need to look at it in the bigger picture over time because you can do anything for yeah. three months, but you can't do it for three months, three, three plus years. And we see a lot of hormonal dysfunction in, in women, which is the last thing I wanted to touch on. Yeah, quickly. Because I know your wife is this, and I've read your baby, about the baby book. I have a Thank you. daughter that's just over one now. So. Congratulations. And we've both overcome our share of hormonal issues, okay. you know. Endurance training. Induced by endurance yeah. training Especially stress. with low carbs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there any key things you'd say anyways to sort of, I know we like the word hack because it's kind of very popular, to, you know, hack a menorrhea that's better than, you know, eat more and do less, because that's essentially what we were told by medical and touch on carbs, the way you feel about carbs for women too, sorry. Sure. Okay, we do have to. Yeah. Okay, we'll do this. I'm not opposed to carbs for men or women. If you have background levels of ketones present, you can eat a lot more carbs, and that's a, a core thing on the Bulletproof Diet. Some days you eat vegetables and brain octane oil and lots of other fats like ghee mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. else, and moderate protein depending on your activity level. Oh, there you are holding the new ghee we just launched, right? So you totally want to be doing that. So high fat is necessary, but high fat zero carb is not necessary or even good for women. You might do it for a day or two, yeah. just like heavy duty exercise. Right. Tell the body you need to be ready for this. And for God's sake, have some carbs, but don't have Pizza Hut. Don't have sugar and all the crap. And you get these, oh, I'm gonna have a cheat day, so I'm just gonna eat shit. Yeah. As an endurance athlete, like go to the finish line of a marathon and look at the pizza and beer. Oh, it's horrible. Don't do that. Like you just <laughs> took a major hit. 
So you want to be doing carbs, but you're doing carbs without a lot of anti-nutrients and without a lot of performance inhibitors in them. Mm -hmm. And when you approach carbs as a, a, a tool, anti-nutrients is a key word there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it so matters, and that's kind of built into bulletproof. And by the way, for people who want to sleep five hours a night, mm -hmm. I slept five hours or less every night, and sometimes only two hours a night for 18 months when I was first getting bulletproof started. But you know what my endurance sport was? It's called entrepreneurship because I was working. As a VP at a big company, and actually like got awards for doing a good job and, and all this stuff. At the same time, I'm starting Bulletproof with a new baby in the house. Mm -hmm. So that's my endurance sport. You know how much exercise I got? Almost none. So we I, have people like that yeah. who are doing all that and training for an Ironman because what you just mentioned was isn't enough for these Type A people. You you will die if you do that. I'm serious. You will take years off your life yeah. if you do that. You have to sleep like a maniac, and not a lot of sleep necessarily, but really high quality sleep. And most people, if you train like that, you're going to need eight hours of high quality sleep or ten hours of crappy sleep, like most people get. Right? Mm -hmm. If you don't do that. Stop exercising that much, for God's sake! Like it's not okay. There's there's faster ways. Like self-flagellation might just be an expression. <laughs> <laughs> we all learn this the hard way, and I think it's uh, difficult when you've got a young child and all the rest of it. You just yeah. don't sleep as well. But for women, yeah, for women though, would you say like quickly on like stress and recovering, menstruation and stuff? Oh yeah, thank you for that. Background ketones can have a huge okay. difference, and there's a new supplement, Keto Prime, and I'm not here to plug my supplements. If you guys buy them or don't buy them, it will not change my life. I'm just going to tell you, Keto Prime is the last step of the Krebs cycle before ketones or glucose in the form of pyruvate enter the Krebs cycle. Yeah. If you have this present and you're dealing with that, it can, have, it can help you enormously because if you have any defects in your energy production, Guess what has the most mitochondrial density of any cell in the entire body? You might know this, it's trivia for medical school. Wow, no, I don't know. Heart? It's a good guess. So, so the, the normal answer is eyes, brain, and heart all have 10,000 mitochondria, except there are a few cells in your ovaries with 100,000 mitochondria. It's mitochondrial, and keto prime just primes the pump for the mitochondria. So if there's anything missing, you can feel a difference there. Mm -hmm. So this is, I've seen really powerful results on that. So the people just become way, way better. They're like, like that time of the month becomes less stormy emotionally as well as physically, just because you've made that last step. 50, what is that molecule? Um, the molecule that's in the keto, keto prime, prime yeah. it's thermally stabilized oxaloacetate plus right. some other cofactors that go along with it. Super. And what that does is it, 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 it allows you to make ATP, you have about 50 grams of ATP, yeah. but it's recycled so many times every day that you have 400 pounds of ATP produced every day in your body. Mm -hmm. That's why you add a half a gram of this molecule, you only have 50 grams, that's a meaningful percentage, and then it can get amplified over and over. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Okay, cool. Yeah. We do a lot of um, testing, my company does, uh, in, in the, which we set up now, does a lot of testing around organic acids, and that oh, looks at... Mitochondrial function. Yeah. And so cool. I'd, I'd be interested to try the, the keto prime we'll and see get how it affects it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You'll see chefs, big chefs. Brilliant. Really exciting. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much for your time. time. Yeah. Appreciate it. Really, it's great to be here all the way from Oh, yeah. <laughs> We've had a blast the last few days. That's so cool. Yeah, we really have. Yeah.